in the darkest shadows, in the white cold, fearlessly we search for knowledge new and old. We drink the strong spirits and read ancient tomes, the order, the order of the Abracast. We are the brave and bold. Vienna, 1683. Today is September 11th, 1683. The mighty army of the Ottoman Empire, led by the savage and radical terror troops of the Dar al Harb, surround the walled city of Vienna and begin a siege to break the golden apple of Europe and kill, enslave, or convert all of its inhabitants. The valiant citizens stand against the tyrannical army with the steadfast leadership of Count Ernst Rudiger von Stromberg the help of the ever-living rebel, Cyrus, the dead guy, and the hopes of the faraway King Jan Sobieski III and his army of flying hussars. The Vienna 1683 comic is available right now from Stigmata Studios at stigmatastudios.com and on indieplanet.us. The Non-Standard Squad, 1944 World War II. Three weird American soldiers are on a search and rescue mission into the oldest and darkest regions of Europe. A cursed, ever-living warrior, Cyrus the Dead Guy. An experimental war bot, Sergeant Lane McCord. An all-red axe, mysterious rogue with a demon-possessed arm come face to face with an army of magically corrupted machine-obsessed elves a magic hammer wielding Norse Ubermensch, and a Nazi wizard who was a member of the ancient Dark Order of the Shining Hexagon. The Non-Standard Squad 1944 comic is available right now from Stigmata Studios at stigmatastudios.com and on indieplanet.us. 100,000 BC, Stone Tools. 4,000 BC, The Wheel. 900 AD, Gunpowder, a bit of a game changer, that one. 19th century, Eureka, the light bulb, 20th century, the automobile, television, nuclear weapons, spacecrafts, internet. 21st century, biotech, nanotech, fusion and fission, and the M theory. And that was just in the first decade. We are now three months into the year of our Lord, 2023. At this moment of our civilization, we could create cybernetic individuals who, in just a few short years, will be completely indistinguishable from us. Which leads to an obvious conclusion. We are the gods now. Peter Whalen from Prometheus, 2012. The Abercast, Occult, History, Conspiracy, Violence. I like the burp. Welcome to the Abercast. Uh, oh, God damn it. Last week's show was about the real life Lord Impaler and his wars with the Turkish Ottoman Empire. In my opinion, it was a pretty awesome episode, so if you're looking for some some real heavy metal history, <laughs> heavy metal history, I like that. 
Did I steal that from somewhere? Heavy metal history. <laughs> Heavy metal history. It was in 1992 that Dave Mustaine joined the... I don't... Whatever. Some um, stuff. Uh, if you've been listening, <laughs> keeping track of me lamenting about this pro story that I have uh, coming out in an anthology, well, something happened with the person that was supposed to be doing the cover of the book for the publisher, which is Burning Ball Publishing. Uh, so uh, I got hired. So I'm going to be working on the book cover as soon as I can get some of this other projects out of my face. I did finish the Novus cover for uh, Novus is a prog rock band. Um, they're releasing a couple EPs this year, this coming year or this summer and winter. I don't, I don't exactly know the release date, but I, uh, I got to do the cover of the first one and it's called hammer. And you want to talk about a f- <laughs> some heavy metal. <laughs> I probably went a little too metal for a prog rock band, but it's, pretty titties if you know what i mean uh you find out ways to support the show they're pretty easy i'm not over here selling you underpants or fucking granolas or whatever you want to support the show you can spread the word around you can hit me up on the social media or and and or you can purchase some comic books stigmatastudios.com go to the little comic book link you can find them i got graphic novels on amazon i got regular comics i actually got some free web web comics you can just read right there online too so check them out uh the first of next month uh i'm sending out a newsletter so if you're interested in getting some behind the scenes uh i also got a couple great uh recipes on there too some cute cat pictures you know this kind of shit you want to know about the studio whatever (laughs) um yeah yeah uh also i'm gonna be doing some new promo work for the abercast so you want to check them out check them out on check me out on instagram or facebook i'll be posting them there they're gonna be like one minute audio clips with the cover of the graphics of the show i'm gonna try to find something (laughs) funny in the show (laughs) to to put on there i don't know so the show i'm I'm gonna try something new with the ads so uh uh, for those of you guys who don't like the ads whenever we switch into the next section of the podcast I'm going to try something a little bit different today. Podcasts, they're like relationships. So you got to try new stuff all the time and figure out what works. So, you know, we're 34 episodes in, you know, and the listenership is on the on the right track. Uh, at the end of every month, I print out... Uh, uh, I print out this bar graph and I try to f- figure out what the fuck it me- all means. <laughs> So, thanks for that. Um, so, <clears throat> after watching Alien Covenant last weekend, I thought it would be inappropriate. I thought it would be appropriate to do a show, an episode about the origin of life, <clears throat> or at least this uh, theory of panspermia. And that's when life comes from outer life comes from outer space, like Prometheus showed us. You know, they had that giant white alien. <laughs> I don't know how they got away with having the having the creator of the human race be a giant white alien. You'd think the social justice warriors would jump all over that shit, but I guess I guess it's all right. I don't a bald one at that. I guess it's okay. Um Yeah, so uh the direct, that was a directed panspermia because that's when the aliens sent life to us. It wasn't an accident. We're going to get into all this stuff. It was just a little bit of a warning here. It's not a trigger warning. This episode doesn't have really have a trigger warning. <laughs> I imagine if you can hang in with this show, um, nothing I say here is going to be too offensive. But with that being said, <laughs> I might uh, use the term exogenesis. Uh, 
instead of panspermia because panspermia sounds a lot to me like a Japanese bukkake video. Um, so, <laughs> uh, I don't know. It just depends on how many times I have to say it going through here. And if I have to say it like a bunch of times in a row, I might just switch it out. So there's a little warning there. If you hear me say exogenesis, it's the same, it's just the same idea. <laughs> but man, what about, geez, what happened to those guys? Those Japanese and there's these boo hockey videos. I wonder if it's anything to do with losing World War II. Uh, I believe that Germany also has a bukkake scene. It's a pretty big coincidence, I think. I might have to do some research into this hypothesis. A lot of research, like a lot of, <laughs> a lot of you know, a lot of, I got to watch a lot of videos. <laughs> but it's weird, like, it's a weird psychologically, like, cultural genre. I wonder, I don't know. It's like, uh. <laughs> domo, 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 domo arigato, domo arigato. Ugh, ugh, Mr. Roboto. Skeet, 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 skeet. Sayonara. I might just be sensitive about this whole Bukaki thing. <laughs> one of one of my cars, I have a. I'd rather be reading Bukowski bumper sticker on it. And I constantly am like looking to see who's behind me to see if they understand. What the, <laughs> what the, who Bukow, what Bukowski is? Well, uh, last week, there was these two black guys in SUV, and I just seen them, like, laughing and pointing at the, at the bumper sticker. And, uh, they were past me, and they were looking at me like, yo, they write books about that shit? <laughs> and I was, I was like, it's, that's not what it means! That's not what it means! He's a writer! Ah! He wrote Barfly! <laughs> Uh, I lost track. Where was I? You're not listening to this podcast to hear about all these cum stories, I'm sure. Oh, Alien Covenant. That's right. Look, uh, I'm not a movie reviewer. This is not a movie review podcast. I mean, the internet's got that covered, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, if you want to hear someone's uh, thoughts and opinions on Alien Covenant, Believe me, there's a hundred thousand places you could probably hear it on a, on podcast. Uh, but I am a bit of an alien snob. Uh, I re I remember seeing the first alien movie back in like '78. It was like one of my earliest memories. Uh, my very first memory was seeing Star Wars in a theater. So you could tell whatever. <laughs> um, but they took me to the drive-through, or not the drive-through. <laughs> They took me to the drive-in, and it was like Rocky and Alien double double feature, and I just remember being terrified watching this watching Alien, and I was bored watching Rocky. I mean, I was like, I was out behind the car. This was the seventies for you, parents making out or doing whatever they're doing in the the Gremlin, <laughs> and a little. I'm outside. Four years old outside in a drive-in movie theater playing in a pile of poison ivy. Man, that poison ivy was the fucking... I hated that shit. Uh, Why would you take your four-year-old to go see aliens? Anyway, or alien, anyways. Oh, God. All right. Yeah, I'm an alien snob, so let's get a few things straight. It takes way more time than 20 minutes from getting your face raped by a face hugger and for a chest burster to pop out and ruin your day. And in Covenant, they actually do this. They say the guy, like, they cut, like, the guy is getting his face raped by the face hugger, and then they cut to, like, the other people, and they're like, hey, let's go and find the captain. We'll meet back here in 20 minutes. And, like, within the, by the time they get back, this chest burster has popped out. It's grown fucking full size. It doesn't make any sense. Haven't they ever seen this first movie? Second item. These aliens are not called xenomorphs, okay? And it makes it quite clear. In Alien 2, aliens, this time it's personal, Ripley's in a hearing with a bunch of board members from the Wayland yutani Corporation. 
and one of these greedy fucking corporate bitches <laughs> is like they're going through Ripley's story and they're like they're reviewing it and they're like she straight up says you experience a life form that no one's ever reported before or some shit like that i didn't re- i didn't rewatch this i mean i did but i don't i didn't put this in my notes i'm re- kind of riffing right now <clears throat> but she's like she straight up says no one's ever seen this thing that you said that you saw and then like 20 story minutes later this asshole lieutenant gorman's briefing his chicken shit outfit of marines that he says Oh, yeah, there might be a xenomorph here. So this is obviously a false identification. Uh, No one's ever reported an alien before. How the fuck can this rookie Lieutenant A-hole Gorman know what it is? It's fake news, people. It's everywhere. It's fake news. The whole world fucking fell for it. Now everyone just calls them xenomorphs. You fucking amateurs. They're not xenomorphs. I gotta start doing yoga or something. <laughs> and I don't care if Jim Cameron calls them xenomorphs, and I don't care if Ridley Scott calls them xenomorphs, I don't care what any of the fucking stupid books say. All right, mix up your gin jihad. Hold all the cum. <laughs> stir it up sip it slow with your second retractable jaw and hurl it into the cosmos with the intent to create life on whatever planet it lands on tonight we are talking about the origins of life tonight we are talking about exogenesis or panspermia panspermia All right, so uh, I had to watch a lot of, I had a lot of watch a lot of uh, Neil McGrassy Tyson, Neil McTyson, on this on the on this note this PBS show called Nova, <laughs> for a lot of it for this section. You guys know who he is. He's like the rock and roll scientist. They're like, we want Neil McTyson and Bill Nye, the science guy. <laughs> to be like president and like queen of the United States. He, he's the dude that looks like he's the Lando Calrissian of pop science. Uh, You know who he is. All right, here we go. Earth, like four or 5 billion years ago, something like that. (laughs) Earth was a hostile planet, lava and fire. And there was a poisonous atmosphere. There was a lot of those particulates. Uh, there was a planet about the size of Mars that smashed into our young planet Earth, spinning out and becoming our moon. Now, I got to really say something about this. <laughs> um, I know I talk a lot of shit on this podcast, but this is a maybe. <laughs> um, there's a lot of weird shit going on with the moon, um, but we're just sticking to Neil McTyson's mainstream version of it for now. Um uh, if you look at my graphic novel, The Ages, I actually explain where the moon came from. <laughs> it's the eye of God that got sma- anyhow smashed out. <clears throat> Jeez. The Earth was a red planet. The sun's light could barely push through our thick carbon dioxide atmosphere. Remember that. There's going to be a quiz later. It's going to come up. The oceans and lakes were green and brown and sludgy. There was no blue water on the on our on our planet. You know the terrible twos? This is kinda like the terrible twos of Earth. You know, we weren't this majestic green and blue marble flying through the fucking outer space. This is like a real crabby shit with a shit-filled diaper, mad as fuck, teething baby Earth. (laughs) For 600 million years or something, our crazy, gross, violent planet survived during a time that they called the heavy bombardment. 
uh, where asteroids, meteors, and comets frequently pounded our ass. Not, you know, pounded our ass, like in a good way. They were like slamming into us, impacting the planet, causing, you know, what would be like catac- like ca- cataclysmic level events now. I mean, there was nothing, the planet was dead, like there was no, no life here. That's kind of the whole point of this podcast, at least up into this, up into this point. Uh, these things were like up to 300 miles across. They wreak all sorts of havoc. They smash into our oceans. They evaporate them in, into like flashes because of the, the heat. And they slam into our surface, surface and they melt, they melt the slag because they come in so, so hot. Imagine a 300 mile across fucking thing hitting the, hitting the planet. I mean, it, it's like a daily thing. It's like, uh, we'll just destroy everything. But right now, all we have is like this gigantic fucking red screaming mad punching bag, basically abused planet. <laughs> Miraculously, wait, I shouldn't throw that word around. Uh, not with this topic. You know, you know, there's no miracles in this world, everybody. Just calm the fuck down. <laughs> so, as McTyson would say, this is when it happened. Whatever it was. Whatever took a few handfuls of inanimate components and um and made it alive it may be a frankenstonian a frankensteinian lightning bolt a person who believes in the power of god might say that it was his will to breathe life can i get an amen in tonight's podcast however this interceding or interloping principle comes from space the idea that life came from outer space isn't such a revolutionary one. Uh, the Greek or the term itself is actually old Greek panspermia. <laughs> the term, um, it, it essentially, it's the idea that life started at one point in the universe and spreads out, distributed by meteoroids or meteors, asteroids, and comets. Just take a quick sidetrack out there for everybody. This is sort of like the conceit of Star Trek, I think. Now, I'm not a Trekkie. I mean, I really like Star Trek. And when I was a kid, you know, growing up near Cleveland, every, like, St. Patrick's Day or something. Was it St. Patrick's I think it was St. Patrick's Day. Channel 43 (laughs) would play, like, uh... Star Trek Marathon. They were able to like chew through the whole three seasons of the regular series. Just like that. And that used to, I used to love that before I had discovered beers. But I think that that's what this is. I think that's what Star Trek is talking about in some ways. Is that the universe is thick with life, bro. Each planet was seeded. And this is why most, most of the races their differentiating features was how many clits they had on their foreheads and stuff or their ear or their, or their weird ears or their wrinkly, the wrinkles on their noses or something like that. <sighs> so if you're a Trekkie and you're mad, I don't know, tweet me, let me know if I'm wrong, but I think that that's what it is. Like they, we all pretty much look alike cause we all kind of the same thing came from the same f- f- fucking place. <laughs> A working example or model of this would be in these old ancient days, if there was a life on Mars and Mars got smashed by a comet, bro, like pow, and it would launch rocks off its surface out into outer space. And they float around for a little while and then they impact the young earth, sharing their microbes or their life mojo, or their space cum, or whatever it is. And this is not simple. A lot of things have to go right in order to do this. You have life itself has to roll a 20 for these items. <laughs> Planetor- planetary ejection. <laughs> so it's got to hit the right place where there's like these microbes or whatever. Uh, it's got to hit it hard enough to throw uh, this material in outer space, then you have to talk about survival and transit. Are you, are you a kind of 
bacteria or microbe or micro animal, as we'll talk about later, that can survive transit unprotected in outer space. You're probably like, dude, you're crazy. It doesn't, nothing survives out there. Fucking buckle your seatbelt, buckaroo, because I, <laughs> I got some info for you coming up later. Then you gotta, uh, you gotta be able to survive atmospheric entry. You gotta roll a 20 for at your atmospheric entry. You know, like everyone says, like you gotta have those heat shields and stuff where you're gonna burn up on re entry. Well, this isn't re entry because these things haven't entered before or exited, they're entering for the first time. I feel like there's a joke here that I'm missing. I can tell you that Mars and the moon has shared rocks with the earth. I know, I know, I know it has my wife, the wonderful Violet Corbeau owns a moon rock and a Martian rock. It's part of her, which rock stone slash gem collection that she has. Uh, and also like in the nineties, I think they found, they also found, a meteor from Mars and it had fossilized little microbes. I remember vividly uh, Bill Clinton standing out there going like, Oh, there is life on other planets. He's probably trying to distract the media from one of his fucking many scandals, scandalous behavior, illegal behavior. He's probably trying to distract the media faking like disclosure for like trying to hide the, the wake of human wreckage and dead bodies that they leave in their path. Uh, but I remember it. So maybe I guess it worked. I also know that the space station here, we go. we're going to get into it. The space station. Uh, there's also been experiments in Antarctica and in Japan where they have been doing exposure experiments, uh, where they're putting a lot of, there's a lot of these variables, but quote, the data supports the likelihood of interplanetary transfer of microorganisms within the meteorites, unquote. So there you have it, folks. No, so this thing in Japan, what they do is they have a centrifuge and they put they put these microbes or whatever, these bacteria is inside like a vacuum inside the centrifuge. So it's like spinning, like it's something's traveling throughout our space is spinning so fast. And these things are actually growing. Uh, there are these, uh, animals called extremophiles, uh, that not only survive, but they thrive in these crazy environments. They, they have these tube worms underwater that like live on these volcano jets, which sounds metal as fucking fuck and legit and metal as fuck. I'm a tube worm living in a volcano jet underneath the ocean. They have these creatures that live in highly acidic environments called like snot o tights or something. I didn't write this down. Um, uh, there's creatures that can withstand crazy high pressures, like super deep sea fish, like these super deep sea fish, like they can go underwater so deep. Like our, our, we don't even have research submarines that could get down to where they are. That shit's crazy. Oh, that's where Cthulhu's hanging out. You know what I'm saying? Then there are other, there are these other guys. They're called micro animals. <clears throat> and they have this, like they have this bug. It's actually kind of cute looking. <laughs> I mean, it's terrifying. And if it was the size of a horse, uh, I would be freaked or a dog or even my cat. If it was any size that I could see it, it would freak me out. But knowing that they're little super tiny guys, they don't really freak me out that much. It's called a tardig trait. Tar tardig trait. Biologists find these fucking things everywhere. They're in high altitude mountains and they're in the deep sea. And these scientists have funny names for them. Like they're the moss bears or they're the water bears or whatever. But you can only see them in like these electron microscopes. But they look like these, they look like these fucking like hardcore, like, <sighs> Do you guys remember the insectoids? <laughs> when I was a kid, we had insectoids and the whole thing is like, there's these action figures and they would ride on these giant bugs, winged bugs. And they'd be like half bug person. 
I don't even think they were a cartoon. It was just crazy, like a winged bug, and the bug thing would be like your would be like a puppet. You put your hand in, and you you can articulate like the claw, like its little arachna legs and shit. You know, fly, buggy, fly. I don't know. You know what I'm saying. I don't know what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying. <laughs> but they took these uh, tar dig trades. And it means like slow foot or something. I don't know. I don't know how fast these people want them to fucking be. They're microscopic. Anyhow, they find them everywhere. And they put these fucking things in space. And they're all just like, hey, man, we're cool. Like, they do this thing where they can, like, like deep freeze. Like, in Alien. Like, they go into the freezers. Or something. They, like, it's like these uh, Kung Fu guys where they can, like, slow down their metabolism. <clears throat> <laughs> slow down their metabolism all right so uh but these micro animals micro animals um they're different than extremophiles and this is the this is the line that they make this is the delineation that they draw where the this thing specifically this tardig trade it doesn't thrive in these crazy at, like atmospheres or whatever they just survive in it so they're not thriving they just kind of like can can survive they're like little like tanks of the micro bug universe little tanks <laughs> i like that idea All right, so we're going to get into this idea. That was panspermia or exogenesis. We're going to talk about directed panspermia. This is the idea that aliens sent life here. This is what the this is what the thing the beginning of Prometheus is. So there was this British molecular biologist, biophysicist, and a neuroscientist named Francis Henry Compton Crick. He was the co-discoverer of the structure of the DNA molecule way back in 1953. He was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in Physiology in 62 for his discovery of this DNA molecule. He was the first sort of mainstream scientist to posit this uh, directed panspermia thing. If you guys, if you watch enough of these enough of these things or if you listen to like Coast to Coast AM and you ever hear Graham Hancock talk about this, he, he always quote, quote quotes unquote crick often using different words <laughs> different words for crick explaining uh he he says something along the lines of you'd have better luck assembling a jumbo jet by sending a hurricane through a junkyard than you would than you would by having a dna molecule coming together by accident or coincidence or some shit like that um so I really respect Graham Hancock, uh, but I think it's funny. Like when he <laughs> when he quotes Crick, it's not like he really quotes Crick. Uh, Crick also, you know, there was a, almost kind of like a happy dark side to Crick. Uh, he was an advocate of eugenics, but unlike the founder of Planned Parenthood, Margaret Singer, he was for what's called positive eugenics, <laughs> where he's advocating wealthy parents to have more kids. Um, instead of killing poor people's kids, like Margaret Singer wanted to do. Uh, he had, he's got, a, he was an interesting character because he was a, he was a vicious critic of religion and his worldview, you could kind of see where, uh, some of his where he was free to come up with some of these ideas that he had. Cause he was, like I said, the first guy to posit this alien, uh, uh, directed panspermia thing. So I'm just going to read this real quick <clears throat> quote. I don't know if I just say quote when I'm doing, when I'm going to read one of these like monologue things. What do you think? Should I, shouldn't I, I don't know. 
<clears throat> the human dilemma is hardly new. We find ourselves through no wish of our own on this slowly resolve, revolving planet in an obscure corner of a vast universe. Our questioning intelligence will not let us live in cow-like content with our lot. We have a deep need to know why we are here. What is this world made of? More important, what are we made of? In past, religion answered these questions often in considerable detail. Now we know that almost all of these answers are highly likely to be nonsense. Having sprung from man's ignorance and his enormous capacity for self-deception, the simple fables of the religions of this world have come to seem like tales told to children. Even understood symbolically, they are often perverse, if not rather unpleasant. Humanists, then, live in a mysterious live in a mysterious, exciting, and intellectually expanding world, which once glimpsed makes the world makes the old worlds of religion seem fake, cozy, and stale. So you can see where this guy I mean, he's his worldview is set up for him to him to be looking for answer. He's looking for, he's looking for answers. This dude. Um, so Crick, he, the, one of the great, <laughs> hold on. <laughs> one of the greatest minds of the time. Nobel winner. The guy who fucking, dis- the guy who code discovered, the DNA molecule. Crick hy- hypothesized this groundbreaking theory the of the story of Superman. Seriously, in the 60s, like 20 years after like Superman was published, he exactly hypothesized the story of Superman. There's this great civilization on the other side of space that was facing some kind of global cataclysm. And they couldn't save the whole civilization. Uh, so they threw some life cum on a rocket and uh, they, sh- they shot it into space and shit and they sent it out into the cosmos. So life cum, like Kal-El is not life cum, but like in the 80s reboot with like John Byrne, um, he wasn't born yet. They put him in a birth matrix and sent him across the, across the spaces, the outer spaces. But back then they, they had a little baby and they threw him in a rocket ship and they sent him across, the, across the space. So this guy's whole revolutionary fucking theory about directed panspermia was, in my opinion, was lifted right from Superman. I don't know. I don't, I haven't heard anyone else say that. <laughs> And I'm not trying to be dismissive of this guy. Obviously, he's a genius. He can find DNA molecules and all this kind of stuff. But, uh, I mean, like, literally, you know, it's just, it's Superman. You're talking about Superman. Neil McTyson, the Lando Calrissian of pop science. Oh, hold on, wait a minute. I gotta back up. Neil McTyson, who's the Lando Calrissian of pop science and the mainstream, look to comet impact, comet and meteor and asteroid impacts of the quote heavy bombardment unquote period of our young <laughs> terrible twos teething shit filled diaper Earth as like a pizza delivery guy. They didn't necessarily bring life to the planet, but they built, they brought all these, the comets and the meteors and the asteroids and stuff brought all the building blocks of life, like carbon and amino acids and so forth. Now, our hypothesis at this time is that 
there was uh, one of these comets or one of these asteroids or one of these meteors actually brought life with it. And during the heavy bombardment, it deposited life that was able to take hold here and kind of grow and, and, and spread out. However, it couldn't spread out too much, you know, because it was still like in this, it was in this heavy bombardment area. We're still getting like smashed. And every time one of these things would hit, it would throw more particulates up in the air. So there's like no s- s- sunlight. So there was nothing for these little, there's nothing for these little Martians or whatever to eat. So our alien life is here and it developed uh, it, as underwater bacteria. And these heavy, once the heavy bombardment stopped, well, once, when the heavy bombardment was still happening, these little guys were hiding these little bacteria and these little microscopic life forms and stuff. They were hiding underwater and probably by those, by these volcanic jets, they call them, they were hiding in thermal vent communities, which is a real white person kind of thing to say. It's a real gentrified neighborhood. These uh, thermal uh, vent communities. Uh, well, once the bombardment stopped, these little guys were able, uh, they were able to spread out and then eventually the, um, the particulates and stuff would settle and they would have more access to sunlight. And so they started to create chlorophyll and with that, they started to be able to photosynthesize, converting the carbon dioxide in, in our atmosphere into oxygen. So I bring this up only because this is another connection to the alien movies. These little dudes were terraformers. They were out there changing the atmosphere of our world. Our world, we had, we had, a, we had a poison atmosphere. If we were like to somehow get transferred back then to those days, even if we can un- take the rigors of time and space travel, because, you know, the planet's not staying in the same place all the time. I just got to throw that in there for anyone who might criticize me. Um, uh, you would show up and you would not be able to breathe and you'd probably get uh, scorched because there's no clouds or anything. Like this, well, there's probably like gross clouds and stuff because there's still carbon dioxide in the air. <laughs> um, but yeah, these little dudes, uh, they they were able to probably cover most, most of the planet, especially in the ocean. They were able to grow. And this is how green plants today are like, do their thing. They fucking do their thing through this chlorophyll and, uh, this photo, this photosynthesis. Uh, every time I say chlorophyll, all I can think of is Adam Sandler going borophyll. Um, but yeah, so this is, a, this is terraforming at its, at the level, like instead of sending big nuclear reactors and and Newt and her family out there to terraform, all you got to do is just throw some space cum on a rock and shoot it into a fucking planet. In a few years, a few thousand years, whatever, it's going to work out for everybody. So uh, with that, I'm going to end this podcast. You can go to stigmatastudios.com to find any comic books that you might want to uh, pick up, buy, you get digital copies of a lot of these things that are out there. There are some web comics that, I mean, the, the art's a little bit on the s- shitty side for the web comics. <laughs> I'm speaking candidly here. I'm telling you guys the truth, uh, but they're free. They're free. You can check them out. Um, <laughs> and that's a great way to support the show. Uh, is to spread the word around, sign up for the newsletter. Like I said, the first of the month, uh, I'm going to send a newsletter out. We're going to be talking about fucking taco. I'm going to tell you how to make taco rolls like pizza rolls, but you make them with taco stuff and there you make them all at home. It's great. Uh, also show you my burnt arm. We're going to do burn watch 2017. Uh, I'll probably have some cat pictures in there. Probably good stuff, dudes. Good stuff. If you're interested, sign in. The Fulcan link is there. If you can't find the link in the show notes, it's on the website. 
Go to if you're like shit, man. This was a great you know fucking hour or whatever it's going to wind up being. I wonder what I can listen to next. I suggest sirs that you go to sirs and madams, sirs and dames, sirs and ladies, marquises and marquises. I just made that last one up. I don't know what that means. Uh, go to society hyphen thirteen dot com. You can check out a lot of my fellow brothers and sisters of podcasting we got queens of nc 17 if you're if you're a horror fan and you like old horror movies and you like smart chicks reviewing them raunchy chicks that's what i'm talking about go to queens of nc 7 go to the queens of nc 17 uh the wicked library is a storytelling podcast and they focus on the wicked things like horror stuff and you go to the lift and you follow that that's also a storytelling podcast you go to red horse radio which is my other podcast when i get locked in a room with tempting melanie who's a, a comedian and uh, my buddy nelson w piles who's a horror writer and we just riff for like an hour or three <laughs> it's a fun podcast you can only find it though on stitcher and society-13.com that, that, that's the only place you can find it it's not on itunes why isn't it on itunes because itunes are difficult sometimes caveman mafia you go to the caveman mafia they have a whole network of shows uh that they that they do uh, including dick dangle if you guys like to hear about cum and bukkake and all this stuff that's a great place for you guys to go because uh this guy's a fucking savage <laughs> and all he does is talk about adult themed stuff so go there social media go to stigmata studios.com you can find a link to my facebook my instagram if you go to my instagram i'm going to start posting um like little video snippets to promote the abercast show so that's fun uh twitter and again my newsletter you can sign up for my newsletter on stigmatastudios.com or the link that's in the show notes i hate doing all this stuff so just if you just buy more comics i wouldn't have to do this so much everybody it's the way of the world <laughs> i'm giving up my time to sell you some comic books the ages begins with the shocking story of Cain and Abel and the journey of violence and revenge spanning thousands of years, following Cain through his cursed life from an ancient invasion of malicious angels to the American Revolutionary War. A masterful, compelling journey through time, the ages delves deep into arcane knowledge, myth, and legend. The art is stunning, and the story takes you on a journey where mortals, immortals, angels, and demons are all forced to deal with the folly that is God's creation. It's a beautifully dark and gritty ride through history. This four-part story follows the astrological procession of the ages and how each 2,500-year age parallels major changes in the development of Earth's inhabitants. Cain's blasphemous struggle with the divine and sacred tyrant God will create and crumble empires, shape history, and cause a cosmic cataclysm. <laughs> Anyhow, thank you guys for sure. And if you don't have uh, if you don't have the money or you don't like comic books because you're some kind of communist or something, uh, a gr another great way to promote the show is just spread it around. If you are a weird motherfucker that likes to listen to stuff like this, then you probably know other weird motherfuckers that would like to listen to shit like this. So pass them a link. Talk to them about the Abercast. The, I'm, this is not a cult. <laughs> I'm not MK altering you. MK altering you. Uh, I'm just saying, let's uh, let's let's spread it around. Let's uh, let's make it bigger. Let's get a community going. Community. And with that, I've embarrassed myself enough. 
with my singing. Uh, so thank you guys. We'll, I don't know what's for sure is going to be next week. Um, but I had fun with this. Thank you guys for listening and thank you guys for sharing. Thank you guys for buying books. If you're buying the books, um, if you're not, please buy the books because I don't want to sell you underpants. I don't want to sell you fucking granola. <laughs> so please, I'm, I write books. So let's just, uh, let's support the show by buying some books. That's all I'm saying. And with that, I'm going to go, I'm going to watch, you know what I'm going to watch tonight while I'm working. I'm going to finish inking this issue that I'm working on right now. I'm going to watch High Plains Drifter because that shit is the shit, yo. High Plains Drifter is the best. Wow, wow, wow. I know that's not High Plains Drifter. Don't fuck with me. That's the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh Hey, hey, hey. Little mini John Lee Hooker fucks me over every time. Dude. I want to hear it again. No, I want to hear this one again. Hey, hey, oh, oh, oh. Ta, ta, ta. Oh, oh, oh.